Hi, I'm Larry Irving, and uh, welcome to Venture Forward. Um, I've been looking forward to this session for a long time. Uh, Venture Forward's um, a program that more of us need to know about. Uh, let me give you a little bit about my background. For the last three decades, maybe four decades, I've been working at the intersection of uh, technology policy, inclusion, entrepreneurs, the digital divide, and trying to make sure that the minority community is more involved in um, technology, media, and all of the opportunities that it provides. I um, started my career working for the late Congressman Mickey Leland, who was chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. We did a lot of work on EEO in the broadcasting um, media industries. I helped write the first cable EEO rules. I helped write the first broadcasting um, EEO rules. Subsequently, I became um, an assistant secretary of commerce working with the late secretary of commerce, Ron Brown. Between Mickey and Ron, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And so I'm really proud of the work they did and the work I was able to do because I worked with them. Um, I'm widely known as the guy who uh, helped invent the concept of the digital divide. And I'm the only African-American in the Internet Hall of Fame because of my work um, chronicling and then trying to cure, uh, trying to bridge the digital divide. Um, it's been a lifelong passion for me. I'm a kid from the projects uh, who got lucky, got uh, well-educated, um, and then found mentors who allowed me to uh, work in areas I wanted to work in. And the digital divide is still a problem, never more of a problem than in this pandemic. We are honored to have with us uh, Jeremy Hartman. Uh, Jeremy and I share a couple of things in common. We love technology. We've both spent our, our lives in the intersection of business um, and technology. Jeremy's done more in communications and working with some of the major companies um, in technology over the last 15 years, almost anybody I know. Um, and he's the vice president now of Venture Forward for GoDaddy. We wanna talk about Venture Forward because I think it's something you all need to know more about. Um, when we talk about the digital divide far too often, we think about it for healthcare and education, and that's important. We think about it in terms of staying in touch with our friends and social media, and that matters. But the reality is that none of those things matter if we can't, if we can't make a check, if we can't grow a business, we can't feed our families. And what the Venture Forward Project does is demonstrates the importance of all of us thinking of ourselves as entrepreneurs and learning how to use these technologies to improve our economic situation, but not just our economic situation, the economic situations, communities um, in which we reside and in which we in, in, engage in, in, in commerce. So it's my honor to introduce Jeremy Hartman, a proud uh, Wildcat, Northwestern Wildcat, but yeah. also Vice President of Venture Forward. Um, Jeremy, thank you for joining us. Uh, Larry, I, uh, I'm honored to be here. And when you talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, we certainly stand on yours. I don't think how GoDaddy supports uh, entrepreneurs today or the work that Venture Forward does would really be possible um, or as available in terms of our research and our data unless you hadn't done what you've done. So thank you. It's an honor to join you in this conversation. So, you know, there are a lot of folks out there who don't spend their lives in technology as you and I do. So what's GoDaddy? So if, if, you, if, you, if you're brand new to this, because we have, we have journalists listening to this, we have entrepreneurs listening to this, we have, you know, academicians listening to this, we have folks in the Black community across the country listening to this, what should they know about GoDaddy? GoDaddy is the largest services platform for entrepreneurs in the world. Uh, we serve over 20 million entrepreneurs um, around the globe, and they come to GoDaddy to name their venture. They come to GoDaddy to market, to build, to sell their venture. And I'm going to give you a little bit of, of, of taxonomy here. When I say entrepreneur, these are not the same entrepreneurs you're going to see on the cover of Inc. Magazine, or they're getting venture capital out of Silicon Valley. We, we talk about these individuals as everyday entrepreneurs, uh, people who are trying to to make a buck, people who are trying to earn extra gas money, people who are deciding to start a venture after a long time walking the halls of corporate, um, people who are venturing off on their own to do their own thing. And they come into GoDaddy for help in doing just that. So now GoDaddy in the last couple of years ago, you and I were introduced by a mutual friend uh, who told me about Venture Forward and I fell in love with the concept immediately. What's Venture Forward and why did GoDaddy decide to invest time, money and energy? I mean, your, your CEO, Mr. Bhutani, um, is enthusiastic about venture forward as anybody I know. So what takes the, you know, the CEO of one of the major technology companies on the planet uh, getting involved in something that affects, you know, relatively, you know, the entrepreneurs we mostly don't hear about. Right. It didn't always used to be the case that this number of everyday entrepreneurs out there were as large a number as they are now. And we're lucky to be able to serve them. GoDaddy used to be just a domains company. So people would come to GoDaddy simply to register a domain. Um, over the course of the last 10 years, over 50% of our revenue um, is now all about supporting these everyday entrepreneurs 
in terms of building up their micro businesses. Um, and as it turns out, there is a lot of policy, there's a lot of trends that are impacting these everyday entrepreneurs and their voices are just not being heard. And so Venture Forward is an effort to understand the economic impact of these everyday entrepreneurs. Uh, we have 10 million in the US alone. The, that 10 million equates to 20 million micro businesses in the US alone and understanding what can we do to better support them. Uh, our early work shown that with every additional uh, micro business that these everyday entrepreneurs are creating, income goes up for the entire county or city in which they exist. Um, for every uh, uh, micro business they're creating for 100 people, the number of jobs go up. So these everyday entrepreneurs are creating positive economic impact on their communities. And in the words of a good friend of ours, Jim Hawk, who served on Secretary Pritzker's team at the, at the uh, Commerce Department during Barack Obama's years, he said, you know, we, we were never able to create policy for what we couldn't see. And he said, we've always suspected that there was this very cellular movement of economic opportunity and economic generation happening around the country. But we couldn't get our handle on it because what we pick up in terms of our small business data doesn't see any of this activity happening at a much more micro business um, activity level. Um, and we're in the fortunate position of being able to capture that activity, which traditional metrics uh, have not been able to capture. So Venture Forward was started to bring this population, to bring their economic contributions to light. We give it away freely. Uh, we work with multiple cities around the country to help them understand how to best support this population. Um, and we look forward to doing it a lot more as the data becomes clearer on just how powerful this population can be. So, you know, we're all suffering through this pandemic. And, we're, you know, I, I, you turn on the news and you see 869,000 jobs lost. Yeah. You turn on the news and um, you see that uh, Black and Brown um, women, Black and Latino women are particularly harmed um, by, uh, by the pandemic and businesses have lost. We've lost 40% of Black, business, black owned businesses have gone under. Uh, just since the pandemic started, uh, billions of dollars of, of lost economic opportunity. Are people turning more to micro businesses, to more to um, uh, becoming um, everyday entrepreneurs in this time? And, and are they, you know, are these folks doing this as a full time or is it decide? You know, I've been black my entire life, and so uh, part of being black is, is understanding the uh, the concept of the side hustle. So are these side hustles opportunities are these uh, jobs? Are people feed their families on these things. Are, do they grow them into larger businesses? What's happening with these micro businesses? Well, first, when we talk about a micro business, it's really all of the above, Larry. It is a side hustle. It is a gig. It is a supplemental income. Um, most of them are meant to gear up to eventually becoming a small business, but it's all of the above. Um, when we talk about a micro business and in terms of where we measure it, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, the way we measure a micro business is anyone who has registered a domain and has created an active website that's attached to that domain. And so when we look at small business numbers, we're taking a look at employee hires, we're taking a look at tax identification numbers. When we talk about a micro business in this sense, it's someone who has just decided to figuratively get up off the couch and actually start their thing, start their venture. And it may just be a name with an active website attached to it, but we see that and we track it. Eventually they add services to that website. Eventually they add transaction engines and eventually they add customers. And so we're seeing all of that. And we have seen in the last year alone in places like, I'm looking at a number right here in Cook County, Illinois, between 2019 and the end of 2020, a 22% rise in the creation of these micro businesses. Now these micro businesses, not every single one of them is contributing revenue right out of the gate, but they're all started with the intent um, to create revenue. And let me just share some numbers for you right now. In terms of um, creating supplemental income for this population, 35% of them create supplemental income, but for the black respondents um, that we survey, it's 42.7%. Wow. Um, those who want to turn it from being supplemental income to main income, for the entire sample, it's 23%. For um, the, the black everyday entrepreneurs, it's over 35%. So these ventures are absolutely creating not only a means for individuals to contribute economically, but it's also creating a really important backstop and communities are getting hit hard um, by COVID and other sorts of economic hardships. Um, we took a look at um, communities where there was just high levels of broadband and Larry, this is something you really helped us understand. 
Broadband alone does not solve this problem. You have to create some sort of ability to create economic um, contributions out of broadband. Um, so just laying the pipe isn't going to do it. You have to give people the skills training to actually create the micro businesses on top of it. And so when we take a look at communities that have equivalent levels of broadband, many of them have been hit just as hard as communities with low levels of broadband. The difference between communities with broadband that have done well is they've been able to contribute skills training to help populations take advantage of that broadband as a means to contribute to their families and their communities economically. So are policymakers, are, I mean, this to me is the economic story of America. We've got to come out of, you know, America's always been driven by entrepreneurs. It's always been driven by small businesses. Most of the job creation, most economic wealth is created at, small, at the small business level. As these communities of color, as, as rural communities, as low income communities get just ravaged by this pandemic, are you finding um, policymakers leaning in? Are they beginning to understand it? And, you know, this audience that we're talking to right now, a lot of them um, are, uh, have the capacity to amplify the message we're uh, conveying today. What message would you want to give either a policymaker or somebody who is trying to talk to a policymaker about why what you're doing, why micro businesses matter so much? Uh, micro businesses matter because they fundamentally change the nature by which people can contribute economically. Um, it is, uh, we talk about it being an additional lever of economic development. Um, it doesn't replace anything that's already out there. It's actually a brand new way for us to think about supporting and uplifting communities that otherwise might, might have, have disadvantages that other communities do not face. Uh, let me give you an important, um, uh, an important statistic here. I was reading a report out of McKinsey recently about black entrepreneurship. And in it, it stated that um, over 50% of the blacks they surveyed who were small business owners were pessimistic about the future of their economy and of their business. The blacks that we surveyed that are part of those 10 million everyday entrepreneurs inside the US, 80% of them were optimistic about the future of their business. 80% of them were optimistic about the future of their state's economy. Why? Because they have a lot more tools at, the, at their disposal when that business starts online and when it starts um, with the capacities that online businesses bring to them. For example, um, in the McKinsey article, when they were talking about why why this population was having such a trouble being optimistic. It's because their ability to sell their customers outside of their two block radius was significantly diminished. Their ability to gain mentorship was significantly diminished. Um, we've seen with everyday entrepreneurs that when they start online, they immediately have a customer base that goes far beyond the confines of their city or the confines of their state. Um, about 75% of the customers of online businesses fall outside of the immediate radius of the micro business itself. And when you start online, you've generally taken some sort of initiative to get online and learn how to start a website or connect with others who are doing the same thing across the world. So your ability to access mentorship is significantly changed as well. So the first thing that we try and talk to policymakers about is don't equate these micro businesses to the traditional small business. They're fundamentally different in nature. They have a fundamental different way of creating economic impact. And they create a really important backstop to when economies run into trouble. So first, understand the benefit and the difference of these micro businesses. Second, in terms of what's really affecting their ability to be successful, we see four really important areas. One is access to affordable broadband. Um, but access to affordable broadband, why that is table stakes, it's not all that makes the difference. You have to wrap skills training around that access to broadband itself. Many people don't know how to start a micro business. And oftentimes it's not just starting a website. You have to learn the rudimentary skills of social media, how to market it. Oftentimes a very simple business plan. Oftentimes a way of how to treat and engage with customers. But we're not talking about a two-year degree or a four-year degree. We're talking about skills training that can happen in so many different ways and so many, many more efficient ways. Um, third is access to capital. Uh, many policymakers we've talked to have, have tried to engage with us as a way of talking about capital as, well, this is how we're trying to address small business. Micro businesses are fundamentally different. Over 60% of them need less than $10,000 to get started. Um, over 50% of them need less than $5,000 to get started. So we're talking about a much smaller amount of money for these micro businesses to get started. And we like to say the difference between supporting a micro business compared to a small business 
from a capital perspective is the same as the difference between a small business and a big business. It's just a fundamentally different type of transaction. Micro businesses cannot deal with the kind of bureaucracy that small businesses deal with. They don't have the kind, same kind of assets. So it's a different, it's a whole different type of transaction that most financial institutions are not set up to be able to do. So broadband skills training, access to capital. And the third one, we know, we hear you, everybody listening, that, act, that um, portability of benefits is a hornet's nest. We get it. But fundamentally, if you are going to start a micro business, any business, you have to be willing to take on risk. And if your healthcare, as an example, is at risk in starting that small business or that micro business, then you are going to be less willing to take on risk, which means you're probably going to be less successful in starting that micro and small business. So we want to ask all policymakers to take this information into account, take our data into account, take our research into account, understand this population and acknowledge that across all four of those policy areas as they can fix them and address them, you're gonna reap huge economic rewards. So the one, the one, the two that I have the longest experience with the access to capital, which has always been the bet noir for um, um, minority owned businesses, getting access to capital. When you're talking about micro businesses, it's even more difficult and broadband. Um, you know, um, as, as President uh, Biden moves his um, agenda um, I keep saying it's you know it's not build back better it's build broadband better um, yeah. and, and and because we really do have to do something you know when you, when I look at the numbers and I I know more about broadband penetration than almost anything else I know um, it it's it it's shocking to me that 25 years after we first started talking about the digital divide we're still talking about the digital divide true story in 1999 before the House Energy and Commerce Committee the last time I appeared, appeared before a committee I used to serve as a Hill staffer. Um, I said in 1999, July, that access to uh, to the internet would be the greatest economics and civil rights issue of the next decade. I didn't count on it being the greatest civil rights and economics issue of the next two decades, but it's we are where we are. Are we seeing an uptick? Um, are we seeing more understanding um, among the policymakers you're talking to? I mean, I know you and I were, um, uh, and, and, and President Bhutani, were um, involved in a conversation with Mayor Lightfoot of Chicago um, and Secretary of State, I think it was, for the state of Michigan. Um, and so I know that at least two folks are getting it, but, but are we seeing folks leaning into this that not only is broadband, you know, we always talk about the cost of building broadband and it's billions of dollars um, in subsidies, billions of dollars of infrastructure costs but we never talk about the economic cost of not providing broadband, of not building these businesses, of not giving people adequate health care. Um, are we beginning to see a change in that? Is your research, you, and as you communicate with folks, do they finally understand that this isn't something that's a you know frivolity, but it's something that's essential? I think COVID uh, has taught us all a lot of lessons uh, and, uh, and gave us a lot of hardships. I think one of those lessons is the importance of broadband and uh, making sure that people want to have affordable access to it, but they also have the skills to bring their businesses online. Uh, we were, um, the city of Chicago reached out to us, and Larry, actually soon after our conversation with Mayor Lightfoot, and they said, winter is coming. And we have um, thousands, tens of thousands of businesses that are not online yet. And we're concerned that as winter comes, that they're not going to be able to um, support their customers or, or thrive as a business um, if they're still offline. And so we worked with them on trying to understand just where those, those businesses were and, 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 and giving them all the intellectual property we had on how to get them up online. And uh, I think they're seeing some advantages to doing that. Uh, so that was a very, I think, quick and painful lesson for cities like Chicago in realizing that broadband is an important infrastructure play, but it's actually a great democratizer and a really important backstop when it comes to getting businesses up online. Uh, a city of a very different size and a very different geography, the, the town of Denison, Texas, about 80 miles north of Dallas, only about um, uh, 25, 30,000 people, I believe. But they took the venture forward data and used it as a, as a, as a means to convince their mayor to create an e-commerce incubator to get their three or 400 micro businesses downtown up and online in a way that they hadn't before. They needed to improve their websites. Uh, they needed to improve their marketing to make sure that as COVID hit and customers weren't walking up and down the street, um, that these uh, both offline 
and online businesses were able to conduct more transactions and reach more customers online. So when you ask, are, are policymakers beginning to realize the importance of this? I think COVID was a very, very cold splash of water on all of our faces on the importance of making sure people didn't just have access to broadband, but they had the skills in order to get them to take advantage of it. You had some statistics that I love that, that show that not only does the individual entrepreneur and, in, and I assume his or her family benefit, but that there's a benefit to the community right. when you have either one or several um, of these micro businesses in that community. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So when we talk about number of micro businesses, we oftentimes, we think about it in terms of number of, of micro businesses per 100 people. So we think about it as sort of a density number and it's a way to, uh, it's a way to think about micro businesses absence of the, of the variables of population. But um, as the number of micro businesses grow per 100 people in a, in a zip code or in a county, you're seeing income levels rise across that zip code and across that county. And the, the reason for this, um, there are many, but the reason for this is primarily the network effect of having the micro business come up and come online. Um, generally, when, when one micro business pops up, it, it, it might not do a whole lot as more begin to pop up around those become connected and become much more powerful as an economic force. And that is sort of a, a, a tide that lifts all boats um, in communities. So these micro businesses, while some may just be creating gas money for, for the, when my, my first day at GoDaddy, I talked to a woman who was a, who was a self-described housewife who made candles and she decided she wanted to start selling them online just for some gas money um, every, every month or so. I talked to another individual down in Alabama who had uh, some extra trucks and wanted to somehow rent out the capacity of those trucks and was trying to figure out how to build a website to do that. All those people, even though individually their contribution might be small, collectively they're helping their entire communities to the tune of hundreds of dollars of median income rises um, relative to communities with a lower number of these micro businesses. I'm going to hate myself for asking this question because it's Lent, and I actually um, am one of those people who observe Lent, and I observe Lent by giving up sugar and uh, pastries, and um, I'm basically, I'm basically going to keto diet. Um, but you know, one of my favorite stories was about the two women in PG County, uh, yeah. the two bakers. Uh, could you tell that story? Because I love that story. It's like, first of all, I love cake, uh, but I love and I, and I love that there are these two black women who, you know, through GoDaddy, through their own entrepreneurial enterprises, through their own vision, um, have created something fantastic. Um, that Easter, I'm going to enjoy as soon as yeah. I get off my Lenten fast. <laughs> oh, it's one of our favorite stories at GoDaddy. And one of the privileges of, of working for GoDaddy is getting to meet some of these everyday entrepreneurs. If you're to walk all, all our hallways, we have hundreds of posters up of the everyday entrepreneurs and the businesses they've started. It's so inspiring. This is our, these are two women who are, uh, lived in Maryland and worked for the federal government. And during the furlough, um, I believe uh, probably about three or four years ago, um, they were, they were furloughed and uh, they needed to try and make ends meet to supplement the, the loss of income. Amongst all of their friends, they were known for making fantastic cheesecake. Uh, so they decided they would start a little micro business furlough cheesecake and see if they couldn't begin selling them online. Um, we caught wind of their story and of their fantastic product, which I think most everybody in GoDaddy's ordered. I strongly recommend it. And uh, they have since not only grown their business tremendously online, uh, they have left, um, I believe, their government jobs full time. And I, I think in the midst of COVID, believe it or not, they started a, an offline brick and mortar business to supplement their online business um, to support their fantastically growing business. And they're just fantastic to talk to you. By the way, they'll be the first to tell you they had no idea how to start a business. And they had they compared themselves to the great entrepreneurs that we follow in the news or those small business individuals who open up a big restaurant or a big bakery. They'll be the first to tell you that they had no idea what they were doing. But the tools that are available to people today, whether it be on GoDaddy or any even take even any of our competitors, are so much easier to use today than before. That even if you describe yourself as having no idea what you're doing. We're seeing furlough cheesecakes pop up all over the country. And so it is not nearly as, as hard as it is, as it was before, as it is today to start a micro business. We just have to get out of these people's way and give them some tools to do it and make sure we're supporting them from a policy perspective. And they're gonna be off and running. Nothing's gonna stop them. 
So for our, first of all, I will be ordering furlough cheesecake um, for Easter Sunday. That will be my when I get off of my Lenten fast. That will be the first thing I try. Um, and, but it's you know it's good to know that in in an era you know we think about I'm old enough to remember famous Amos or Mrs. Phil's cookies that yeah. you can still do that and that these um you know the furlough cheesecake can you know these two women can be Debbie Fields that whose name I still remember 30 years later. Um, by using these tools that the internet provides. So folks, if you're listening, Perlo Cheesecake, two sisters trying to do the right thing, um, help them out. For folks who want to do the right thing by understanding this more, where, do, where can they find the, the, uh, the information about Venture Forward? How can they lean into this project? Um, I actually believe that coming out of this pandemic um, online, you know, we've all changed how we do commerce. We've all changed how we live our lives. Online is much more important. And it is important that we all we know that there are these micro businesses out there that we can support, um, both in terms of of, of policy um, and in terms of of trying to buy their goods or services using online. But for folks who want to know more about venture forward, more about the kinds of folks you're supporting, where do they go? Uh, well, GoDaddy forward slash venture forward dot com um, is the the quick and dirty answer. A second, let me say, please don't be a passive um, a, a passive participant and just look at the information. We really want to hear from you. Um, we really want to understand how different cities and counties and towns across the country, what kinds of challenges and opportunities they're experiencing with micro business and everyday entrepreneurs. We have a lot of data to give you. Uh, if you reach out to us, we will love to work with you on different and doing different slices and dices of the data. But we do this to support this population, but we also really need to learn um, from cities and from towns and from influencers and policymakers about what they're about what they're facing. Let me give you a quick antidote. I know we're running up on time, but when we reached out to Chicago and they when we engaged with Chicago, the way they think about their everyday everyday entrepreneur population and their micro businesses was mostly through the lens of, of a crisis. It was the COVID crisis and what was that was doing to the economy. When we reached out, for example, Gilbert, Arizona, one of the most prosperous cities in America by virtue of education rates and availability of jobs and healthy migration and great public schools, when they came to us uh, to better support their micro businesses, it was not from a position of a weakness or crisis, it was from a position of strength. Their population is going to be doubling every 10 years. And so they came to us and said, clearly, with close to 40,000 micro businesses, in the city of Gilbert, we need to find a way to continue to attract people because they like starting these micro businesses, even if it's not, even as if it's not as important to them as it may be for those in Chicago. And so, what can we do to support them? Very different situations, very different ways of looking at the data, very different kinds of opportunity sets. So, the only way we learn about that is from hearing from all of you. So, take a look at our, take a look at the information. We're happy to work with you on it, but we also want to hear from you in terms of the challenges and opportunities you're facing so we can then in turn help others. Um, I think we're up against time. Um, I think we've run out of it. I, I have another million questions, but I, I hope and expect that you'll hear from a lot of folks about this. I know you and I will co continue this conversation uh, outside of this particular forum, but I really do hope people lean into this. This, this matters. Um, you know, I, I, my dad was uh, worked for Con Edison, but he also had the side hustles. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a lawyer, I know these folks that, and people need to understand, this is about accounting, accountants, and it's lawyers, and it's candle makers, and it's bakers. It's whatever your business is, whatever you're trying to do. Um, and, and we need more people to understand how important this is our economy, particularly as we come out of this COVID era. Jeremy, I can't thank you enough. I know you're on vacation. Folks need to know that you took time off your vacation to join us for this. Uh, thanks for your time. And thanks for making us smarter about uh, GoDaddy, about Venture Forward, and for you know raising a banner of everyday entrepreneurs. It was a privilege to be on the panel with you, Larry. Thank you so much. Thank you.